All right, so 13.4, this is the last section in chapter 13 that we need to cover. And uh, what we're doing here is we're looking at applications of uh, some of the concepts we've talked about in chapter 13. Um, derivatives, integrals, vector functions, and things like that. So uh, this is going to mimic or mirror uh, something that you do in Calculus 1, where you introduce the idea of a position function of a, a, a particle that's moving along a... Uh, a straight line and show that um, if you have a function giving the position of that particle at any given time the derivative of that position function or displacement function you sometimes call it that the derivative gives you a velocity function and then the derivative of that velocity function also gives you acceleration so we're going to kind of walk through the same ideas here except the difference is that uh, the um, the ability for a point to move along a space curve gives us a lot more freedom than we had in the Calculus 1 case. You see, the, the difficulty with the case in Calculus 1 is if a particle is moving along a number line, you know, where its initial position is at, say, zero, you know, that, that particle can move left or right, and that's basically it. Um, and those are the cases where we think about position, velocity, acceleration. <clears throat> But the overwhelming majority of uh, problems where we need to consider position, velocity, and acceleration are not confined to a straight line. We are imagining objects moving through space. And uh, the introduction of a space curve is what's going to give us the freedom to deal with these things, uh, these, these sorts of concepts, in a more realistic context. So um, <clears throat> throughout this section, anytime we're working with a space curve, given by some uh, vector function r of t, we're going to imagine that space curve as a path. Uh, namely, it's going to be a path that a point or a particle is moving along. Um, and if the, the function r of t gives us that space curve, we're going to uh, think of t as representing time. So at a, any given time that I plug into my position function, it will give the position of that point or that particle at time t. That's the way we think of that. Okay, now because this point is moving along this space curve, um, the uh, point will have some sort of velocity associated with it. Remember, velocity is uh, a combination of two things. It's, it's a speed, but it's also um, direction associated with that. In the case of uh, Calculus 1, our Calculus 1 concept of what velocity is, there's only two directions that you could travel. There's right, and we think of that as a positive velocity, and then there's left, we think of that as a negative velocity. That works in the case of only two different directions, but in space you can move in an infinite number of different directions, and so the positive and negative concept of velocity doesn't really suffice anymore. Um, that's where we replace that idea with a vector. A vector can point any direction. And not only that, a vector has two quantities that we associate with it. It's got a direction, but it's also got a magnitude. And so what we'd like to do is come up with um, a velocity function for this moving particle. And uh, it's going to be a vector function. And at any given time t, the velocity vector for that point should have a magnitude equal to the speed of that particle at that time. So the longer the velocity vector, the greater the uh, speed, or um, yeah, the greater the speed at that time. And then the direction of our velocity vector should indicate the direction at which that particle is moving in that instant. Okay, so um, the derivation of this is essentially the same as the way we derive the velocity function in calculus one. Velocity is a rate of change. Uh, specifically, it's a change in distance or displacement um, over some time t. Okay, um, So this is going to look exactly like how we set up our definition of the derivative back in 13.2. If we imagine, um, if we think of this particle moving from starting at time t to a very short time after that, t plus h, and this h can technically be negative, so it could represent a time before t, but uh, it, it doesn't really matter how we think of that. Um, we just want to imagine h as being very close to zero, so that these two points are very close together. If um, we take the, the uh, point at time t and the point at time t plus h and compare those two points, 
then the distance that it traveled is technically the arc length of this curve from P to Q, but we can approximate that arc length um, by just uh, taking the difference between these two position vectors, like we saw back in 13.2. That would be the length of this line segment joining P and Q. The smaller h is, the closer these points will be together, and the better that approximation for that arc length will actually be. Um, but then, because again, we're looking for a rate of change, uh, we want the change in, um, in the position of the particle, which is what the difference of these two vectors is, over the change in time from t to t plus h. That would be h. So and remember, dividing by h, which is the same as multiplying by 1 over h, will take that vector that goes from p to q and scale it. In this case, it looks like it's enlarging that vector, but you know it depends on what the function actually is. Um, and then again, the goal here is to get an instantaneous velocity, not an approximation or an average velocity. So as we do in Calculus 1, we take the limit as h approaches 0, so that q is brought closer and closer to p, giving us uh, a velocity vector. So that is where we get our velocity vector from, but that's the exact same way that we define the derivative of r. And so as you probably expected, our velocity function as a vector function for this particle moving along the space curve is just r prime of t. Okay. Um, now, as we also said a little earlier, the velocity function uh, is a vector function, and the magnitude of that velocity vector at any given time t should represent the speed of that particle at that time. And uh, to confirm that, um, it's fairly easy to see why that's the case, because I'm going to use um, an unbolded v to represent speed, but that's the same thing as the magnitude of our velocity vector at time t. If v of t is the same thing as r prime of t, then this is, this is equal to the magnitude of r prime of t, but we've seen this expression before. In 13.3, uh, we show that the magnitude of r prime of t is equal to ds dt. Oh, sorry, one second. <laughs> 